I want no blood on my hands. I want no blood on my hands. Ezekiel 3, please. Will you go there? Ezekiel 3. Third chapter, I want you to begin with me on verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou gavest, givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand." Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, also thou hast delivered thy soul. Heavenly Father, this is a trembling word. It's a shocking word. And it causes me, Lord, to tremble in your presence. And we have to be honest about it and deal with this message. These words from the prophet Ezekiel, O oh God, Take my words, drive them into our heart, Lord, so deeply that we'll never forget them. Lord, what is our responsibility in this wicked city of New York to warn? What is our responsibility to warn our families and those on the job? What is our responsibility so that we can stand before you without blood on our hands? Lord Jesus, we've read this many times and we've just skipped over it. We can't skip over it anymore. We're going to face it head on this afternoon. Deal with us in love, but make it real. Drive it deep into our spirits. Lord, anoint me. Let me hear it from the Spirit and speak it from the Spirit. And Lord, may it be an impact on me and everyone who hears. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want no blood on my hands. I told you this scripture causes me to literally tremble physically. Spiritually, emotionally, I tremble when I read this. I've read it many times, but this time the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me go any further till I faced it. Now the Holy Spirit <clears throat> comes upon a godly praying man, a prophet. He had been a priest, and God moved him into the role of a prophet by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he warns this godly, holy man that it was possible for him to go into eternity with blood on his hands. That's how blunt it is. That's how clear it is. There's no mistaking what God said to this prophet. He said, Ezekiel, I'm going to give you a, a challenge. I'm going to give you a warning. He said, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning for me. And then he was told, if you will not warn the wicked, to warn them of their wicked ways, to save his life, that wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. That must have been the most shocking word that Ezekiel had ever heard in his life from God. The possibility of going into eternity facing God with blood on his hands. Also, he was told, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I'll lay a stumbling block before him. In other words, God never causes anybody to sin. But the Bible says that very thing that the righteous man won't let go, and he continues in it, even after the plodding, prodding and the pleading of the Holy Spirit, it will rise up right in his face and be a lie that he can't deal with. And it's going to cause him to turn aside from his righteousness. He shall die because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin. But his blood will I require from your hand, on your hand. Think of that. Not only the wicked, but the righteous who turn away from their righteousness and turn to iniquity and die in their sins. If I don't warn them, if you don't warn them, God said to this prophet, 
I'm going to require their blood on your hands. The only way you can deliver your soul, he was told, from blood guiltiness is to warn the sinners to repent, go to the backslider and the rebellious believers to turn back from their wicked way. Now, folks, I take that seriously because God makes it clear in his word that every shepherd has been called to be a watchman. Every teacher, every evangelist, every Sunday school teacher, you're called to be a watchman. Hebrews thirteen seventeen says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I'm a watchman. As a pastor, I'm a watchman. When I, I speak to our vast mailing list, I speak as an evangelist and prophet. And, and, and the, the Lord makes it very, very clear. I have to give an account. Everyone must give an account. I'm a watchman. Every pastor, every evangelist, every teacher, everyone is called by the name of the Lord. We are watchmen set on the wall. And we must give an account. They watch for your souls and they must give an account. Now, these words cannot be avoided. When I go to the judgment seat of Christ, I have to give an account of everything I've preached in this pulpit. I have to stand there and answer. I have to answer for those wicked ones that came in here. I have to answer for all the righteous that are here in this congregation. I have to answer as this Pastor Carter and those who minister to you. We have to give an account. Those who've turned away from their righteousness. I'm obligated by the Spirit of the living God in His Word to warn you. To preach conviction upon you. To hold your sin to your face before it become a stumbling block and you die in your sin. If this be so, I wonder how many preachers are going to be responsible for Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches, and the majority of those churches that stood before, that are going to stand before the judgment. How many preachers are going to have blood on their hands for those who lost their first love? How many pastors are going to be responsible for those who were holding false doctrines, who allowed Jezebels to teach, who allowed fornicators in God's house, who told God's people they were alive when actually they were dead, telling people that good works would save them. And those pastors who produced lukewarm believers, letting them believe that they needed nothing when in truth they were blind and and wretched and miserable and spiritually blind. How many pastors are responsible for Laodicean condition in the church? The, people, the prophets had scathing words, scathing words for shepherds who would not preach against sin, would not warn the people in their time. The priest said not, where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. For the pastors have become brutish, means stupid and blind. They've not been seeking the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper, and their flocks shall be scattered. Jeremiah cried out, Woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastors, saith the Lord. Now some are going to recoil against the thing that I present to you right now, this truth. You say that's the D. That's the law. That's the Old Testament. We are under the day of grace. It's not possible that in this day of grace that ministers of the gospel and shepherds and teachers can have blood on their hands at the judgment day for a lack of warning the wicked and the righteous about their sins. But let me show you something. Look at how the apostles, after the cross... In the full blaze of the day of grace. Look how seriously they took their challenge and their call. After the cross, Peter stands up. To, this is after Pentecost. After Jesus died in the day of grace. He cries out to the crowd, save yourself from this wicked, crooked generation. 
He pointed his finger at them and he said, You have crucified both the Lord and the Christ. You crucified him. Flee from this crooked generation. Repent and get right with God. He took that challenge. He would have no blood on his hands. How seriously do you think Peter took his calling when a husband and wife in the first Pentecostal church in Jerusalem lied to the Holy Ghost? He didn't gloss over it. He didn't say, well, they're just new converts. He called them before the whole congregation. And he said, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? Because Peter was not going to have blood on his hands when he stood before his Christ on Judgment Day. He said, you have lied to the Holy Ghost. And they both dropped dead teaching every church generation to follow that God means what he says. How seriously do you think Stephen took his challenge, the challenge of Christ, to preach truth to those of his generation? He looked at the crowd of priests and Pharisees and scribes and elders, all of them in rebellion, all of them living in sin. He said, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Stiff-necked. Stephen knew he's going to pay with his life. But when he stands before his Christ, on that day of an account, a day when he gives account, he said, I have no blood on my hands. He told the truth at the cost of his life. You're stiff-necked. You're uncircumcised in heart. You're hard-hearted. And you'll crucify the Son of the living God. You've crucified the Son of the living God. Paul the Apostle would have no blood on his hands when he discovered incest and fornication in the Corinthian church. He sent them a letter. He said, you Christians in Corinth, he's addressed them, you've been puffed up. You've not mourned because of this deed. You did not deal with this man. I urge you to purge out the old leaven. Deliver such a one unto Satan. Do not associate with fornicators. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Paul says, when I stand before my Christ, when I stand before God, I'll have no blood on my hands. I have warned you. I've kept the faith. I've fought a good fight. I have warned you. You see, a true man of God who loves his people is not a pal to his congregation. He doesn't come just to be flattered. Better to be riled up by your pastors. Better to run out of this church angry but convicted than to have a pastor get up and flatter you into hell to appease your sin and make you feel that everything is okay. In Ezekiel chapter 2, we see the Holy Spirit entering into Ezekiel. He's just been given this, this mandate. He's preparing to go and speak this message of judgment. God told Ezekiel, the people have transgressed. They've rebelled against me. They've become hard-hearted to my warnings. You shall speak my words to them. And whether they listen or reject my warnings, they will know a prophet has been among them. So don't be afraid of them. They're going to be hard, but I'm going to give you a forehead of granite. I'm going to make you your head harder than their hearts. So that when they come bang against you, you won't break. They're going to break. And he said, I'm going to make you a strong preacher. Nothing is going to hinder the word from going forth. They may not listen, but I'm going to make you a hard four-headed prophet that you will not break or bend. Now think of what God told Ezekiel to do. He said, I want you to fill your very heart and soul with this word that I've given you that judgment is coming. You see, the Chaldeans are going to come down and it's just a short while when the city is going to be evacuated and they're going to be taken away and they're going to be persecuted and they're going to be taken into captivity bound hand and foot. Judgment is coming. And God says, I want you to eat this message. I want it to be, I want you to be so full of it. 
And he's told that his congregation that he's called to preach to is going to clearly understand the word. He said, there'll be no confusion about it. In fact, he said, I'm going to give you a word that if you would take it to the heathen, even though they don't understand your language, they'd understand your spirit and they would interpret it and they would get it and they would repent. But you see, my people, he said, have become so hard. They've sat under my teaching so long, and I've warned them so many times, rising early, sending prophet after prophet. And under this teaching, under this preaching, they've grown hard. And he said, I'm going to send you to these people. He said, they, the heathen, would have hearkened unto thee, but my people will resist your word. Now, isn't there something he's telling them to go and preach the hardest message they've been called to preach? And he said, they're not going to listen to you. My people are not going to. Now, the heathen would. You've heard me. It's just a cliche. You've heard me say some of you have heard enough gospel to save China. And I believe that with all my heart. That's what God's saying to the prophet. The heathen will listen, but my people won't listen. God help the church. God help us. If we do not have bold prophets in these last days with stone foreheads, God help us. If we have men who stand in the pulpit who are afraid of, to preach because of the fear of men, God help us if we don't have prophets who weep over the backslidings in God's house. God help us when we have preachers in the pulpit who have not heard the word of God. They borrow the messages from one another. They get it from a book, they get it from other sources, but they have no original clear word from God. The man who stands in the pulpit is not to be a man pleaser. He doesn't preach for money. He's not yearning to be loved and pampered. The man who preaches the mind of Christ, the mind of God, has been shut in with the Lord. He's heard the sound of the trumpet, and he will not cease to preach what God tells him to preach no matter what the cost is. I've had to make up my mind recently to, to warn people on our mailing list <clears throat> messages like the awful consequences of backsliding. I send out newsletters now to almost 800,000 people and I tremble because on judgment day I have to answer. I have to answer if I should at any moment God tell me to preach something so strong that half my mailing list goes or if all of the mailing list goes and our source of money dries up that came from that source. And God says you will preach what I tell you to preach in love out of brokenness because I have seen the judgments coming. I've seen the more than thousand fires burning here in the streets of New York. And God help the church if all we have left in our pulpits at this midnight hour are men who stroke their congregations, feeding them on the rubbish of pop psychology, telling them that they're going to paradise when actually many are going to hell. God help the church. If all we have in our pulpits now are mild-mannered shepherds who spare the flock the truth about the wages of sin, who tell the sinners, come to our church, we're here to please you, we're here to make you comfortable, we're he here to help you ease your way into the kingdom of God. No, you don't ease your way into the kingdom of God. You can't go softly into the kingdom of God. On judgment day, how many backslidden, damned people, churchgoers, so-called Christians, when they stand before the judgment and they know that they're lost and they know they're numbered among the wicked, how many are going to rise up against their pastors and their shepherds and they're going to shake an angry fist and say, Pastor, you were Mr. Nice Guy. You were all sweetness and mercy. You said you didn't want to offend me. You provided me and my family with aerobics and basketball and dance classes and social events and marriage counseling and child care. But you didn't talk about my lifestyle. You didn't talk about my sin. 
You were, more asked, you were more interested in packing your pews than saving me out of hell. I had wickedness in me. You blinded me to my sin. Never once did you preach conviction to me. You only said, believe and be saved. You didn't talk about repentance and holiness and separation. Pastor Shepherd, you never warned me. And there'll be a cry to the throne of God. Oh God, let my blood be on his hand. Beloved, I don't know when in eternity the Lord wipes away tears. My own feeling is that it will come after the judgment. When we stand there at the judgment, even the believers who come with him to judge, I believe he's going to wipe away the tears probably at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't know. But I wonder how many tears I'm going to shed. How many tears, Pastor Carter, and those shepherds all of the United States who are true, godly shepherds have been shut in with God, preaching truth and reality and love and brokenness. How many of them are going to weep as they see their flock? Those backslidden, those who heard and heard and heard and hardened their hearts. It won't be, I told you, I warned you, I pleaded with you, see? No, it won't be, I told you so. It'll be, oh my God, oh my Jesus, have mercy. I'll be there. I will be there. And those who sat under our preaching for months and years and still turned from their righteousness, hardened because being often reproved and hardened the heart, cut off without remedy. I don't think my tears will be shut off. Any true shepherd's tears will be shut off and probably till the marriage supper of the Lamb. When he wipes away all tears as a pastor, I don't know how I could stand there. I don't know without his supernatural grace and strength to see those who've heard so much preaching, had so much reproof, and still hardened their hearts and continued. Now, see, when it, con it concerns the wicked outside the church, so I happen to pastor here in New York City. The proudest, largest, most probably one of the most wicked cities in America. And I live on the 30th floor, a block from here, in the church. And I have a view of the city. And I want to tell you, I've spent hours and hours pacing the floor and looking out my windows and weeping over these buildings because I know that in just two or three of the buildings outside, there's probably 15, 20,000 in just some of these. Uh, I, I look over toward the, the east, uh, the Hudson River there, and I see one complex that's got over 25,000 people in one complex, one housing complex. And I say, oh God, in the greater me Metroplex area, that includes the, all the greater New York, New Jersey area. There's 17 million people. 17 million people. You look down to Wall Street and you see covetousness and greed. You look down at Greenwich Village and Soho and you see homosexuality flourishing on all sides, being flaunted. And you, you look at this city and hear of, on news and radio and and newspapers almost every day, the raping and the murder. You, you look out your window, you see kids coming out of school, teenagers angry and rebellious and cursing. And you see the wickedness and the vileness of this city. Folks, I don't ever want to come to the place where I get so used to this city and its commerce and its activity and its intensity that I lose this heart cry about the wickedness and I look out and I cry, God, how do we reach the city? How do we warn? How am I going to stand before you? I don't want blood on my hands. And there's a tendency because I, I want to figure things out and I, I want to get a yellow pad and a pencil and start concocting ideas on how to reach the city. How do we get it out? Do, do we hit the streets? Do we uh, pass out literature warning that judgment is coming? God, show us how. I cry and I weep. How do you reach Wall Street? How do you reach the theater district? 
How do you reach Harlem and Spanish Harlem? Son of man, I've made thee a watchman. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his, un his wicked ways to save his life. The same wicked one shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. Now, folks, this dilemma that, that our pastors face and I face, this is exactly the dilemma Ezekiel's in now. God tells him this, this awesome word, gives him this awesome word, and I'm sure he's sitting down and crying, Oh, God, I hear you. Now, how am I going to do it? Where do I start? Do I start like Jeremiah up and down the streets weeping? Do I write letters to the leaders? God, what do I do? If you're going to have me stand before you on the judgment, you're going to hold me responsible. Then how? And that's my heart cry, God, if I stand one day called to this city to warn of coming judgment and you're going to hold me accountable then you have to tell me how you have to tell the church how and in Ezekiel 3 21 and 22 as the prophets pondering these awesome challenges and no doubt wondering how he could ever fulfill it the Holy Spirit comes upon him the hand of God touches him and God gives him direction. And they were strange, strange directions. Look at me, folks. God tells this man, you're responsible to warn your generation. You're responsible for my house to warn all those who sit under your preaching. You're responsible to warn. And then suddenly God does a strange thing. Verse 21 Verse 22, and the hand of the Lord was there upon me. And he said unto me, arise, go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Then I rose and went forth into the plain. I went into the valley of the wilderness. Now look here, please. God said, before you say a word to the wicked or the backslider, let me tell you, and what this God is saying something very profound to us, as he was to Ezekiel. He said, Ezekiel, in yourself you have nothing to say. You have no warning. You've got no word. In fact, he goes on, you read the rest of the chapter, he says, I'm going to call, I'm, I'm going to shut your mouth, I'm going to cause your tongue to cleave to the roof of your mouth, so that you can't say anything in your own power, your own strength. Because you'll go out there in human zeal and you'll do more damage than good. He said, I'm going to take you out into the plain. I'm going to get you all to myself. And when you spend time with me, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to show you my glory. And what the glory of God is, is the awesome, actual presence of Jesus Christ. He said, you're not going out until you're filled with me. You've got to be so full of God. And I'm going to have you so full of the word. I'm going to put every word in your mouth that you're to give to the people, both the wicked and the backslider. It's going to be a divine wisdom that I give to you. You'll do exactly what the Spirit of God tells you to do. Then he does something else. He, he, he gets him alone. Look at the, verse 23. Then I rose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there. And I fell on my face. All right. Are you ready to hear the word? We called this church to a 30-day prayer chain, round the clock. Many have signed up back there. We'd like to have at least 2,000 signed up. You're given a little card to put your name on. That's just to put your time on that, the time that you're going to pray to remind you so you can, you won't forget it. 
put it in your pocket or your purse. And we're going to do exactly what God told Ezekiel to do. He said, I want you to come away. I want you to get on your face. I'm going to reveal myself to you. And here is Ezekiel now. Ezekiel walks away. He said, it's not time yet. Yes, I've been told to warn. And I know there'll be blood on my hands. But the Holy Spirit has called me alone with God. Alone with the Lord to get the message. And when he's alone with God, he's so awed by the presence of the Lord, he falls on his face. Let me say something. Probably almost every street preacher in New York either attends here or has visited here. And I thank God for all the street preachers. But may I say something to you who preach on the streets? Let me tell you, if you are not shut in with God, if you're not a praying man or woman, and you have gone to the Lord and you're there every day on your face before God, and you're a praying man, you're a praying woman, and you have been filled with the presence of the Lord, you've laid on your face before God, weeping for the lost. If you haven't done that, if you have not been shut in your prayer closet, you're out there babbling on the streets. You mean nothing to God. Stay out there 24 hours a day preaching, but unless you've been on your face, unless you've got your word on your knees from heaven, you're babbling. You have nothing to say. I thank God for you. I thank God for all the street preachers. I tell you, I love every one of them. But you're just babbling unless you've come from his presence and heard the true word of God till your heart's been broken. You stand there weeping. And same with the pulpit standing here. I have been called as a pastor and I don't get my sermons, nor does Pastor Carter get their sermons from books. I go to God as the disciples did. And every time I go to prayer, I think of myself as a disciple with a basket. And Jesus, they're breaking the bread. And I come to him and say, Lord, there's nothing in my basket. There's nothing up here. I've got nothing in my intelligence. I've got nothing to say to this people. I have nothing. Lord, if I preach out of David Wilkerson's head, it's nothing but garbage. I don't have anything. Lord, you're the one who breaks the bread. You've got to fill my basket, then you fill my basket. I'll go out and feed them. <laughs> then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me. And what did the Lord say? Now, you've been alone with me for a while. No, 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 no. Go on out now and warn. What's verse 24 say? Then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me and said unto me, What? Go shut thyself within thy house. Why? He will seek me. Folks, we're going to seek God. I tell you, in 30 days, if you'll be diligent and if you will pray, here's what we're to pray about in this prayer chain. God, show me, show the pastors, show all of us together how to reach the city. Our homes and the church to warn the wicked and the backslider that Jesus is coming and get right with God. And give us, give us the spirit of Christ in which to do it. Give us the words from heaven. Give us out of the book. That's why I'm saying if you're going to pray without reading this book, I mean, first of all, before you go pray, spend a half hour, 15 minutes to half hour at least in the word. And then take these promises and, and the word to God and challenge him on them. Do you know God's going to hold you responsible for warning those on your job? But first, he's going to shut you alone. You will seek his face. Folks, this idea of having a prayer chain, we're not doing that just to, to be busy. This is not works. This was born of the Holy Spirit. God is saying, I established churches in the middle of cities like this. I established churches for a purpose. It's not just to keep the remnant clean. 
It's to be a testimony, a warning to the whole city. And I promise you, if you will seek his face diligently, he will tell you how. He will give you words when you pick up the phone to talk to unsaved loved ones. I'm saying that after 30 days, God ought to be moving on hearts everywhere to pick up their phones and call all over the world. We have over 100 nationalities here. Get on the phone and warn your loved ones. God said, I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb. Well, you talk about dumb. It means speechless. I'll make you speechless. And shall not you shall not be to them a reproof. This is verse 26. I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth. Thou shalt be dumb. And shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. Listen to me, folks. We've got a multitude of self-appointed prophets running all over the United States saying, Thus saith the Lord. They claim to be speaking for God, but much of what they say is flattery. Some of it's just nonsense. Often the warnings are, are, and the prophecies are, are meanderings of the human mind. God has not spoken to them. They're just empty words. I, I get it from our mailing list. I, I get We get reams and reams of prophecies. And you try to go through it and they're just meanderings. They just go on and on. about Some of it is absolute nonsense. And they're saying, thus saith the Lord. Or God hath said, God said, God said. And my Bible tells me it's a dangerous thing to say God said when he didn't say it to you. God said, I'll judge you and your house. According to Jeremiah, it's a great sin to claim to speak for God when God hasn't spoken to you. God says, they speak lies. Jeremiah 23, they use their tongue saying, he saith. They prophesy false dreams. They cause my people to err by their lightness. Folks, whenever you see a man in the pulpit who tells jokes and just gets people to laugh all the time, you can tell he's a false prophet right away. They cause my people to err by their lightness, by their joking spirit. Yet I did not send them. They shall not profit the people at all. They have perverted the word of the living God. They are prophets of the deceit of their own hearts. I will punish that man and his house. Beloved, I don't want God to punish me or my house because I stand flippantly and say, Thus saith the Lord. We have people, when I lived in Texas, I, I had so many who called themselves prophets come, and if I didn't listen to them, they'd curse me. One man left his shoes outside my door to shake the dust off his feet. While he's shaking the dust, he forgot his shoes. He sat in my office for an hour babbling about the rubble bubbles, rubble bubbles, rubble bubbles. I didn't even know what he was talking about. He was rambling. And, and he had a whole following of people who said he's a great prophet. But that great prophet had a spirit of anger. He had a hatchet in his hand. Don't dare say, thus saith the Lord, unless God has spoken. And he only speaks to those who are shut in with him who bear his word. Folks, I'm not against God. I'm not against pastors. I got a letter this week from a, a dear pastor's wife, and she said, Dear Brother Dave, please quit criticizing our pastors. I'm a pastor's wife, and I've seen dedication from my dear husband for the past 34 years. We are both diligent in our devotion to God. My husband works 50, 60 hours a week. We do not have great results like you do. And we've often asked why, but we're doing our best. We need encouragement. Don't criticize the pastors. Let me tell you something. Any godly pastor who's shut in with God, who hears the kind of preaching I'm preaching right now, will cry amen. They know who they are. 
they know who they are. They'll not be offended by it. They'll not be offended. When I hear a man of God preach thunder, when I hear him preach, I don't care how hard it is, I'll say amen if it rings true. I'll say amen even if it cuts me to the core of my heart because every time I hear a true word of God, I want it to deal with anything hidden in my life. I want it dealt with. <sighs> Hallelujah. But if they had stood in my counsel or if they had understood my mind and it caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil ways and from the evil of their doings. Do you understand what God is saying here? If he's a true shepherd, if he's a true prophet, he's going to warn you about your wicked ways. Listen to it again. But if they had stood in my counsel, if these prophets of these shepherds really had been hearing from me, they would have caused my people to hear my words. They would have turned them away from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. In other words, he said, those who speak for me turn my people away from sin. Now, a word to those believers who sit under our preaching. The words you hear come from this pulpit are words that came from that secret closet. They came from shepherds who were shut in with God. I say that with all assurance. It was given to us when we were alone with God. We go to the Lord as one who is dumb. We go to the Lord as one who's tongue cleaves the roof of his mouth and then we come out like this but when I speak with thee I will open thy mouth and thou shalt say unto them thus saith the Lord God God said only when I loose your tongue only when you know that God has spoken you've been alone with God you've been into this holy word of his and it's been a hammer that's broken your heart and it's been the oil of gladness. The word begins to rise up in your heart. God says, I will tell you when to speak. I'll give you the words to speak. Folks, the Bible said we're not to cast our pearls before swine lest they turn and rend you. There comes a time when God will just say, this is not the time or the place. Yes, we are responsible. We're responsible. But first of all, God says, before... And above all your other responsibilities, even this great challenge about blood guiltness, he said, above and beyond all that, if you'll just get along with me, if you will seek my face and humble yourself before me, I'll make you the kind of person. I'll give you the word that you need. And it'll flow out of you like living waters. And it'll be effective. The easiest thing for me to have done this afternoon was to get you all stirred up. Place this uh, burden on you. This burden of blood guiltiness. I could have placed this on you and say, hit the streets now. Go home and get on the phone. Call everybody you know. Grab a handful of tracks and witness to everybody up and down these streets immediately. Go out and do it. But if you don't have the true word of the Lord and the burden of the Holy Spirit and the brokenness in the presence of Jesus, it's not going to have the effect. The Bible said these things are given to us in this example upon us, upon whom the ends of the world have come. All of these things are given for our benefit, for our training. And I look at this as my training. I do know that when I sit down here, when I'm finished this message, I do know that over these past few years especially, over these eight, ten, eight, nine years we've been here, we have warned the wicked from this pulpit. I've warned all over the United States through books, literature. We've warned those that sit in this congregation to get rid of your rebellion 
We've warned you against gossip and slander. We have warned you lovingly with tears and brokenness about holding grudges against people. And I'll tell you honestly, the greatest wickedness of anyone in this house today is not drugs, alcohol, promiscuous sex. The greatest sin in this house are those Christians who know better and keep grudges in their heart. And I tell you now face to face, I tell you face to face and warn you now, just is here because I will not have your blood on my hands. I'm telling you now, you're hardening your heart. If you have not by now humbled yourself before those around you and you still carry grudges and bitterness in your heart, you're almost beyond help. You've been warned and warned and warned. You know, you know what is the best thing to do? If you're not going to sit here and obey the Lord, go find somebody who's going to flatter you. Go find somebody that's going to back you up in your sins and let you do what you want to do. But I'm telling you, you won't do it in this church. God won't allow it. The Holy Ghost won't allow it. I'm not a dictator or anything else, but I, I want to deliver my soul. I want to know that I've delivered my soul. The Lord said, if you've warned, you've delivered your soul. Folks, we've done it in love. And sometimes you can sit under a message sounds so hard, and yet that's the most loving message you'll ever hear because it's the love of God for our precious souls because he loves us so much. My father spanked me many times. I got a lot of spankings when I was a kid. And he'd come down across my backside and he'd quote scripture, foolishness is bound in the heart of the child and the rod will drive it far from him. But I thank God because that's why I stand here in this pulpit. My dad never once winked at my sins. And I'm telling you now, you have pastors in this pulpit who will not let you slip into hell. We will stand here and love you. We, Folks, sometimes when we go to God, he comes to us with the bread of mercy, sometimes with grace, sometimes with love. But then he comes sometimes with warnings and woes. Sometimes he comes with message of judgment and crying out. And you can almost hear the gut cry of God himself coming from your pastors. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I must tell you this. I believe the majority of people here hearing me now, the majority of you, have not turned away from your righteousness. You love God passionately with all your heart and you want to grow in the Lord. I thank God for you. And if that's you, you rejoice in what you hear right now. You say, thank God, Brother Dave. Don't be afraid, Brother Carter. Preach it. Listen. This man who walks with me preaches in tears. I've seen Brother Caesar preach in tears. I've seen all of our men, teachers, with brokenness because they care for your souls. So they must give an account. Will you stand? Hallelujah. Beloved, up in the balcony, here in the main floor. <clears throat> Do you know how you can tell you're walking in the right direction? It's because you allow the Holy Ghost to convict you. You don't shake it off. You don't say, that's not me. You say, oh God, turn the light on. Turn it on me. Turn the light of the Holy Ghost on me. Turn it, Lord. I want to be right before you. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart, you see, mo mostly the message this afternoon is aimed at preparing us for the next 
30 days of prayer. I want you to go back there. and Don't sign up back there unless the Holy Spirit's needing you to do that. But I'm calling you as his servant, as God called Ezekiel, to come away into the plain and go to your house. We're not going to be praying in the church. Those hours, you're not to come here to the church. You're to pray in your house. If Times Square Church is your home church, you say, Brother Wilson, this is my church. This is where I belong. I'm asking you to take this burden with us. You can't leave it with just the pastors and staff. You have to join us. And I want you to, we want you to pray like you've never prayed in your life. And we want you to take upon you the responsibility. I want you to, you can read this every day in Ezekiel 3. Just read that chapter every day until the Holy Ghost makes it very real to your heart. And you'll come out of this prayer time with the clear word of the Lord. He'll tell you who to call. So you're not responsible for the whole world. You're responsible for those that God points out to you, to those who are near you, to those God sends you to. And he'll send you. And he'll lead you. And would you pray that God give the word to the pastors? That every wicked person, every sinner that comes in here will be confronted lovingly about his sins and be genuinely saved and not just raise their hands and vote for Jesus? We don't want people voting for Jesus in this church. We want people to repent and cry out to God. Oh, God, what must I do to be saved? That's the kind of conviction we want to see in this house. Folks, if you've been coming to this church and you feel, hey, God's been blessing, you ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen anything yet. God's going to come with convicting power. He's drawing us as pastors closer to him, and I believe he's wanting to draw this whole congregation to him. You fellows at Timothy House and over at Sarah House, the girls, this is 30 days of prayer. We're going to pray it. Pound the gates of heaven. Hallelujah. So, oh God, give me your word. Open heaven to me. Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your love. Give me a love for lost souls. Heavenly Father, do that for us. Change this church. God, shake this church. Shake us. Lord, I want you to shake me as I've never been shaken. I want you to bend me like I've never been bent. I want you to put my face on the earth. Lord, I want every member of the staff to have their face in the dirt, so to speak, O oh God, until we are so full of the message, so full of Christ, that you send us here, you send us there, you give us directions that come from God that will be backed up by the Holy Ghost. And it will be effective because we're doing what God told us to do, His time and His way. Hallelujah. Lord, we'll accept the responsibility. We will warn the wicked. We will warn the backslider. But, oh, God, we'll do it under the anointing, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, and full of the Spirit of Christ. Hallelujah. If, if the Holy, this is the only thing I know, if the Holy Ghost spoke to you in any way, and you need to repent of anything, Get out of your seat and come here right now, and I'll pray with you. Up in the balcony, go to either side. If the Holy Ghost, while I preach, and God spoke to you about something in your life, or, or you say, Brother Wilkerson, I don't want a stumbling block. you got a stumbling block right in front of you. Lay that stumbling block down before God right now. If God spoke to your heart, you come up here and we'll pray. We want to see your family saved. We want to see your families healed. We want to see your marriages healed. We want to see God work and move. Folks, I'm not satisfied. Are you satisfied that what God's done? There's so much more he wants to do. We've just begun. Oh, God, help us to see that we've just begun. I want everybody came forward to raise both hands. I want you to pray this with me right now. Oh, God, I need your help. Break me, Lord, and melt my heart. Let me not take it for granted. All the things you've done for me. I need your spirit, God to help me pray and to seek you. Lord, turn me around. I laid down all my sins, all my prejudices, all my grudges. I want to be right with you, God. I want to be clean. Cleanse me, Jesus, and lay your hand upon me. Call me to prayer, and I'll follow you, Jesus. Now let me pray for you. God, everyone who has their hands raised now, 
standing before your holy altar. God, hear that cry. Break and melt our hearts. Let us start a new life of prayer beyond anything we've known. God, not just by hype, not by emotion, but by the Spirit of God laying hold of us. Spirit of God, lay hold of this congregation. Lay hold of us in Jesus' holy name. I want you to just praise Him. Now, folks, raise your hands and just praise Him. My Lord, I praise You. I worship You. I give You glory. I give You honor and I give You praise. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the tape. This is the conclusion of the message.